Welcome, everyone, to Head Talks. Thank you for being here a few days before Christmas. I appreciate that. So we're going to go on. We're continuing on with, what are we talking about? Kings and Queens of England. Yeah, we're doing Kings and Queens of England. I think everything's going to uh, give me a hard time today. We'll get through it. We've been through worse, right, guys? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll get through this one, too. All right, so yeah, we're going to go on in our uh, series on the kings and queens of England. And today, we're going to meet the very first Plantagenet king. That's going to be our focus in the series, is the Plantagenets. All right? But before we get to him and his incredible story, I have to first get you all up to speed, right? All right, so I'm going to get you all up to speed, and that is where we, um, we were in a time uh, frame last week. It's very specific. Do you remember the year? Excellent. Yes, yes, yes. We were in 1066 because that is when what happened? That the Battle of Hastings, that's exactly right. You're exactly right. And 1066, the Battle of Hastings changes everything, remember? Yes, it changes everything. William the Conqueror. Who is William the Conqueror? The fellow that won the Battle of Hastings. Yes, the fe yes, he was, you're right, you're right, I didn't say that. Yes, because I thought I'd get bleeped out if I said that. Did I, so did you all hear that? Before he was called William the Conqueror, he was called William the Bastard. Can you guess why? You know why. Yes, you, yes, you know why. So um, yeah, he was also called Duke of Normandy. He was called several things. Um, and especially by the Anglo-Saxons, I'm sure. So he wins the Battle of Hastings. We've been, we've been through all of that, and we know that things go really smoothly right from the very start, remember? He's coronated, he has his coronation on December 25th, 1066, a few weeks after the Battle of Hastings. And of course, what language does William the Conqueror speak. French. He's French, and now he is in London, and they speak what? English. They speak English, so you could see how that might pose a little problem. It does, immediately, right out of the gate. It poses a problem. So at his coronation, he has his soldiers are um, on guard right outside, and his noblemen are in with him in the cathedral, and he's uh, being coronated, he's being uh, crowned the king, and so they're announcing in French that he's the king, and do you all accept and pledge your loyalty to the king? It's announced in French, and so there's a lot of polite French nodding and yes in acceptance, and then there's a translation that is spoken in English. And when the English nobles hear this, they want to, you know, get off on the right foot with the new king. And so they very exuberantly shout out, yes, yes, we accept and we pledge our fealty to the new king. And as they're doing this um, in great uh, shouts and cheers, what do the guards think is happening? Riot. Yes, riot. they think it's a riot. They think something terrible is happening inside. And so what do the guards do? What do the French guards do? Kill they go, yeah, they go through. They start burning London down, right? They're going to put down this revolt that they think is a revolt. And um, they're, they're burning London down, and they're killing people. So you can see uh, William has a wonderful start to his reign as the king of England. And it doesn't get any better, does it? It just doesn't get any better. He has all his people come in, correct? Yes. What happens to the English nobles? 
There, yes, back to the country, Barbara. That's an excellent way of putting it because William the Conqueror um, takes the land away from the Anglo-Saxon nobles and gives it to his French noblemen, barons. Who said that's not nice? That is not nice. Um, it's not friendly. Yeah, so he was not making any friends. Who remembers last week we talked about how many castles William had to build because he was on such shaky grounds? 200? It was, it was between 500 and 700. I've, I read different, I didn't get, well, like, I, you know how I get three sources for everything I put up there? I couldn't get three of either five or seven. So I'm saying between five and 700, yeah, that he put up. Um, everything becomes French, everything. So the way that the people were dressing, the language, everything is done in Fran French. Uh, the newspapers were in French. The, the um, legal documents were in French. The currency was in French. Everything is in French. All right, so what's happening to the English language? It's going, yes, yes. And it's only being saved by who? We know it survives because, I mean, we're all speaking it, right? So we know that it survives, but it's being saved by the people way out in the country. They're still, they are the only ones that are still speaking it. But in the courts, it, within the nobility, everybody is speaking French, behaving French, everything in, about the culture is becoming French. Okay, so William has a duty now, all right? He wants to start a dynasty, correct? All right, it's very important. You've got to do that. So does he take care of that? Oh, he certainly does. He has four sons. Yeah, he has four sons. All right, so let's look at those four, and he has daughters. Let's look at those four sons. We have Robert is the oldest, and what... Um, automatically has to happen there. He's, he's got to be the heir because that's how it goes. That's how, the, how things happen. And so he's trained to become king, except what happens between Robert and his father? They don't. They have a very, very strained relationship. Now, as an adult, Richard... The second son, he dies in a hunting accident. So what does that do to uh, William Rufus? He's the spare now, isn't he? Yeah, so we've got an heir and a spare. And then, of course, we've got little Henry. Henry's the baby of the family. He's the last one born. All right, so he's the baby of the family, and he is educated academically. And normally, when you're educated academically, it means that you are going to what? Yes, yes. So you, yeah, so you are being educated uh, to enter the priesthood. And I just find this just so incredible. If you are being prepared to become king, do you need to know how to read and write? No. Do you need to know anything about history no. or philosophy or politics or anything <laughs> like that? The, in this time, the thing that was most important, if you are preparing to become king, you need to know about this. Yes, yes, Bob, and this. Is that cool? I found that, and it distracted me for a few minutes until I snapped out of it, and I got back to work. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, so you need to, your preparation to become a king in those days exclusively means that you must learn military strategies. You must become a fighter. Right? You have to be a rough, tough guy, and you have to be able to win battles. All right? So, all right. Yes. The, what? The flying, the flying knight, yes. Yeah, flying would be a good um, skill to have, too. All right, so we know that William dies, remember? 
William dies, and when he does, he has a mysterious stomach issue. So it comes on unexpectedly for him, and while he's seriously ill, William Rufus and Henry are the two sons that come to see him, but very briefly, and it's written that uh, William the Conqueror died alone. So he died alone, but he was able to write down his intentions. He wrote down his intentions, and we know exactly who uh, gets what. And what happened to Robert, remember? Yes. Robert was, yes, pushed aside. That's exactly right, Bob. So Robert is named Duke of Normandy. Is that as good as King of England? No. No? No, no, not really. Not really as good. And the King of England goes to... William Rufus, yes, goes to William Rufus. All right, so now we've got two brothers, and the father has obviously snubbed the older one. Robert feels like it's his right. It's his birthright. So how do you think the relationship is between Robert and William Rufus? <laughs> Not good at all. And so now they are going into battle one against the other. William Rufus is defending what his father bequeathed to him, and Robert is trying to take his birthright. And so these two are trying to kill one another. And then we've got little Henry. You remember little Henry? Yeah. Little Henry is just, he is in between his two brothers. All right, so sometimes he's sympathetic to Robert, sometimes he's sympathetic to uh, William. Rufus. So he's caught in between. Now Robert is going up against William, and who wins? Do you remember? William does, yes. William Rufus wins. He beats his older brother in battle, so Robert has to go back to Normandy. Well, his little brother Henry's in Normandy at the time, and Robert is so so angry about this that he accuses Henry, his younger brother, he accuses him of being a spy for William. And there's no evidence of it, but he accuses him of it. And what Robert does to his little brother is, yes, he imprisons his little brother. So Henry is in prison for months at the hands of his oldest brother. Now, after years of these battles, something extraordinary happens. The thing that happens is the Pope is calling for what? Crusades. Yes, the Crusades, and there is a great, grand, wonderful prize if you go and fight in the Crusades. What is the Pope offering everybody? Heaven. Guaranteed heaven, exactly. No matter what you do, no matter what you do, you've got a beeline into heaven. Where did everybody think they were going in the 12th century? To hell. No. Well, <laughs> well, just make that <laughs> but where were you go where were you going if you weren't going if you couldn't go if you weren't a saint and you were going you can't go straight to heaven. Yeah, so everybody everybody was headed to purgatory. That's where everybody thought they were headed. Okay? So now this is a great prize. The pope is saying you can go straight directly to heaven and just bypass purgatory all together. Robert wants to go. Robert really really wants to go. This would be glory and honor. This is what he wants to do. But who's going to take care of Normandy if he goes to do that? Henry. Henry. Nope. No. Nope. nope. He wants, oh. yeah, he's thinking, all right, well, I've got my brother that I've been trying to kill for the last few years, and maybe if we just get together and talk it out, um, he will take over Normandy for me. Well, I'm away on crusades, and then when I get back, he'll give it back to me. And so he gets together with William Rufus, and they do, they talk it out, and William agrees, okay, fine, I will 
cover Normandy for you, and they made an agreement that if either one of them dies without an heir, that they will name each other, okay? So they're gonna name each other. So Robert could conceivably become king of England um, in this way. So it's a happy ending. Look at those guys, right? No problems there, correct? So off Robert goes and um, William's fine. He's very happy with this arrangement. But then uh, we're forgetting about one of the brothers. Henry. Oh yeah, we have to, yes. Yeah, so we're forgetting about Henry. When Henry gets out of jail, he goes right up to William. He, go, he goes up and he's gonna hang out in the courts with William. So he's getting, he's kind of supporting William now. He's in good with him. And so he's there with the nobles in London and they all decide to do, you know, what noble men do um, in that time. They're all gonna go out hunting, right? Yeah. They're all gonna go out hunting. So. Henry goes out with his brother William, and of course they have some guys out there with them, and unfortunately, tragically, another hunting accident. there's another hunting accident, exactly, Edith. Yeah. There is another hunting accident, and William Rufus dies. He dies. He's accidentally shot by an arrow. He dies in the woods. All right, Henry and his men find William there, and they are in such a hurry to get back to London that they actually leave William in the forest. No autopsies. They left his body in the forest because they're in such a rush to get back to court. They have to get back to court because there's an awful lot to do, isn't there? No. All right, so the very first thing that we need to take care of is Henry needs to get the key to the treasury, right? You have to have access to the money. And remember, he's been in William's good graces, he's been in the court, so some of the noblemen in the court are supportive of Henry, and he does, he gets the key. He gets the key, and not only that, um, they decide, all right, we're gonna go ahead and we are going to crown Henry. They crown Henry, King of England, three days after the hunting accident. Three days. All right, what else does Henry have to take care of? He's got the crown, and he's got the key to the treasury, and with the key to the treasury, he thinks it's in his best interest to make an exceptional donation to the Pope. That would be a good idea, right? Yes, so he does that. He makes a really, really nice donation to the Pope. The next thing he does is he's gotta get married, right? He needs to get married because he's got to produce an heir, so he marries Matilda of Scotland, but she's also of the house of what? Wessex. 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 And is that going to put this, this um, French Dane heritage in good with the Anglo-Saxon people of England? Yeah. That's a great match, isn't it? That's really going to work in his favor. So now he has that. The other thing he's doing is he is letting everybody know that, you see, 1066 was the Battle of Hastings, right? When was Henry born? So he's telling everybody that he was born after his father becomes king. So he was born to a king. So he's saying to everybody, I am the only son of my father as he was king, and I am the only son born in England. The others were born in Normandy. So he is making a great case for himself. He's doing it with great speed because 
Who's on their way? Who's coming? Yes, yes. Remember, Robert's been off on crusades, correct? And as soon as he hears about this, what Henry has done, what's he going to do? Oh, he's going to come. He's going to come with him, with every, at him with everything he's got. So by the time Robert gets back, is the Pope on Henry's side? Yeah, he's got the Pope on Henry's side. Are the noblemen, the barons, the landowners, are they on Henry's side? Does he have this solid marriage so that the um, Anglo-Saxon people are for Henry and Matilda, right? So he's got a lot of support. He's got a lot on his side. When Robert comes up against him, Henry is the one that wins. Henry wins. All right, so it seems like Henry has taken care of everything. It seems like his academic education has really served him well, don't you think? Yeah, he was able to think through a whole lot, and he got himself in a very good situation. But he does have the problem of the brother. Robert didn't die. He did not die in the battles that they, um, that they went up against. So Henry has to do something with his brother, and really, it is just uh, what Robert deserves. Do you know what he did? Killed him. Put him in jail. He put him in prison. All right, just as Robert put Henry in prison, Henry put Robert in prison. And Robert remained in prison for the rest of his life. And the extraordinary thing about that is that Robert lived to be 83 years old. 83 years old. Life expectancy was about half that. So it was an extraordinary uh, lifespan that, that Robert had. So Robert just stayed there. He stayed put for all that time. It couldn't have been too tough if he lived to be 83. So now we've got Henry, and he is solidly, firmly established in his throne. He is king of England, isn't he? But what else is he? Duke of Normandy. Excellent, yes. He is also Duke of Normandy. All right, so let's take a look at the accomplishments that Henry has uh, brought into his reign. Now, the first thing that we're going to see is, now that this is all over, there is finally, finally peace, peace in the country, in the two countries. Well, the, the country and the province. All right, principality of Normandy. So he brings peace. He also wants to begin to put the two countries together. He wants to mend the fences here, and he wants to make it unified. One of the ways that he does that is he uses this system. It's called, have you ever heard of this? Yes. Yes, I think you've probably heard of this. Okay, so an exchequer is begun with Henry I. He's now Henry I of England. And so he uses this system because he's going to have a uh, tax system and it's going to be throughout the lands that he oversees. And so everybody is going to be paying the same tax percentage. That sounds good, right? Yeah, that sounds good. In fact, it was so good, it was so good and so popular, the exchequer, this is one of the very original ones, okay? So you are paying your taxes on an equal system on an equal basis and you have a paper note right for you to pay taxes and we still have that today do you know what it is it's a check it's a check so it started there the exchequer is what comes down through time as what we now use as checks yeah, and that's becoming obsolete though, isn't it? Right, writing checks, not for you, Edith, yeah? Yeah, I, I, I don't think that, uh, like my grandchildren write checks, yeah. I don't think they know how to do that. 
Um, so that's becoming obsolete. And then he did something else, and this was just an absolutely stunning, shocking, um, crazy, crazy idea that Henry I had, and that idea was to appoint men to positions based on their skill and not their status. Based on skill, not status. All right? So he put people in positions that actually knew what they were doing rather than who their father was. All right? You can imagine uh, that didn't go over too well with everybody. But what it did do for what was called the new men, they were called new men, uh, it created another level of society. So now you had a professional level of society, all right? He also took care of the most important thing. The most, what? Yes, yes, he produces in air. Now, last week I shared with you, um, so his surviving, his two surviving children, William and Matilda, um, weren't his only children. Does anybody remember how many illegitimate children he had? <laughs> 22. There were 22 illegitimate children, but he had the, these two. And really, this is all he needs. He just needs this. So he's all set. Can any one of his illegitimate children, even if they're males, can they inherit the throne? Not easily, anyway. Maybe through some kind of crazy way. Um, but not easily. But he's all set. He's got William. In fact, I should just note, too, that um, Henry was a really good father, even to these illegitimate children. Do you know that William and Matilda knew their half-siblings? They knew one another. Henry acknowledged every one of them, had a relationship with every one of them, took care of them financially, provided for them, um, and they had good relationships with their half-siblings. All right, but he has William. William is the only person he really needs, so he is completely 100% all set, everything's good to go, except there's a tragedy, there's a disaster. This is a very famous uh, disaster. It's called the White Ship Disaster. Have you ever heard of it? No. Apparently, I read in a, in a footnote in a, in a document I was reading that at the time, it was as sensational as the Titanic would have been. That's how big of a deal this was. So it's called the White Ship Disaster. And what had happened was William, the heir to the throne, gets onto this ship, it sinks, and everybody on it, everybody on the ship died, including William, the heir to the throne of England. All right, so now we've got William, uh, I mean Henry the first, he's in his 50s, and he's not going to be able to provide another heir. All right, it's just too late. So he's trying to think about what is he going to do. He just was not expecting this, right? And he's got his daughter, his daughter Matilda, remember? Yeah. Matilda, she's married, and she's married to Henry V. Um, he's the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So that would have been, I know, that's pretty big. That's a pretty, pretty big deal, yeah. right? All right, so she's married to him, and then that makes her what? Empress. Empress. All right, so Henry's thinking, all right, well, I have my daughter, and she's married, and she's married to an emperor, and if they have a child, that's going to solve everything, yes? That would solve everything. All right, if they have a son, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm going to be okay, except guess what happened? He died. Oh, he died. He died. All right, so now Matilda is a widow, okay? So now Henry wants her to marry immediately because he's still thinking if they, if I have a grandson, it could go to my grandson. It'll go to my grandson. 
but he's, wor he's getting really worried about this. He actually brings all of his noblemen together saying, I want you to acknowledge my daughter. I want this to go to my daughter and then her child. So please acknowledge my daughter if I die. Um, acknowledge her and his noblemen agree they say we will will acknowledge, will acknowledge Matilda and then her children but he wants her to get married so she they set something up for her immediately and so now she's going to get married to Jeffrey and he's called Jeffrey the fair that's why I found like this gorgeous guy <laughs> All right, Jeffrey the Fair, all right, and Jeffrey the Fair, he's not the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, but he is the Count he's of cute. Anjou, and he's handsome, yes. All right, so he's a good-looking guy. So he's figuring, okay, great, we, we'll, we'll get a grandchild out of this. So Jeffrey, here we go, Jeffrey Plantagenet, Count of Anjou. Now, that's not like a little thing. Look at this. France at the time is divided into these very powerful principalities, is what it is, okay? And they're run independently. And so Geoffrey, he's the count, and he's got, look at, he's got a pretty good chunk of land there, right? Okay? So she, Matilda, daughter of Henry I, marries. Jeffrey Plantagenet. So we've arrived at the Plantagenets, right? But do you know that Plantagenet is not a family name? It's not a family name. Plantagenet is a flower. <laughs> it's a flower, and this flower was, uh, could be seen on the, on the family crest, and Jeffrey would frequently be seen wearing the flower, you know, in his hat or on his lapel or someplace. He would wear it, and um, so they started calling, people started calling him uh, Jeffrey Plantagenet. Now, they didn't call themselves that. It's not a family name. It wasn't until a couple of hundred years later that historians found it easier to name this dynasty Plantagenet. All right, now you know, right? Now you know. So Matilda, daughter of Henry, and Geoffrey, they do. Guess what? They have a son. They have a son. And his name, he's named after his father. All right, this is Henry. So Geoffrey and Matilda have the grandson that Henry I was hoping for. And then, of course, we know what happens, right? Henry I dies. He dies. I debated really on whether or not telling you um, what he died from, and I decided to go ahead and tell you. I was debating because it's really gross. <laughs> But I decided to just go ahead and tell you. So he had um, just, he loved to eat these lampreys. All right, does anyone know what they are? He loved, he loved them. They were his favorite. In fact, his doctor was advising him to stop eating them. Don't eat them. Um, but he didn't listen, and so he ate a whole bunch of them. He overate them, and he died. <laughs> he died. All right, so, yeah, so, th so that's what he, yeah, that's what he died from, eating lampreys, which, yeah, they're eels, but they're, it, they're very gross. I found the least gross <laughs> photo that, that I could find. All right, so now we've now he's now he has passed away, and we should be okay because we've got Matilda, we've got Jeffrey, and we have got little yeah we've got little little baby Henry. He's going to be Henry the second, right? Well, except there is just one little glitch, one little glitch. You remember the white ship disaster? 
where his son had passed away? Well, there was supposed to be somebody else on that ship, and somebody else that was supposed to be on that ship had decided just at the last minute that he wasn't going to go. He's just not going to go. And that somebody is named Stephen. And Stephen is the nephew. All right, so William the Conqueror also had a daughter. Remember, Henry's the youngest, but he has a sister who's about two years older than him. All right, and she has survived, and she has a son, and her son is Stephen. And Stephen thinks that he has a claim to the throne. Why? Through the bloodline. Blood. Bloodline from William the Conqueror. Because, but he has a daughter. Because he's a man, and Matilda's a what? Matilda's a woman. And so his argument is that a woman could not be okay. ruler, queen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis says, she can't be a king, and I agree. <laughs> so Stephen has a strong claim, and it becomes a legitimate claim because of male attitudes about women in that day. And so this enters us into what was known as the time of the anarchy. So here we have the daughter, the legitimate daughter of the king. And the king has said, this is who I want to have the crown after me. And yet, what was Stephen able to do? The nephew, what was he able to do? Advocated. He was able to take that crown based solely on gender based exclusively on gender. Now, I had put up this photo, correct? And that looks very much like, a, like a, a beautiful young woman with her baby, all right? And that was representing Matilda. I want to share with you a little clip about how women were um, thought of in the 12th century. This is what you might picture when you think of the Middle Ages. The days of knights protecting castles and defending the honor of damsels in distress. While tales of chivalry were often just legend, for most girls and women in medieval times, distress, hardship, pain, and suffering was a historical fact of life. Those born into noble families had easier lives than those born as peasants or serfs. But all females were considered inferior to males by nature and by law. Laws were set by lords and kings and by the male heads of the Roman Catholic Church, a powerful influence on society in the Middle Ages. Women were taught to obey men, their fathers, and after they married, their husbands. The primary job opportunity for most women was to have and raise children. Girls were often married by age 14 and had their first baby by age 15. Medical knowledge and care was crude. Dying while giving birth was the most common cause of death in young women. A famous medieval poem, Piers Plowman, described the average peasant woman as rising a knight to rock the cradle and also carding combing, clouding, and washing wool. Spinning sheep's wool into thread and yarn was such common woman's work that the tool used, a spindle or a distaff, became a symbol of the peasant woman. Women living in medieval towns had a better chance of learning a trade by helping their husbands in family businesses. While they were generally banned from joining the powerful professional union guilds or charging as much as men, there were women merchants, druggists, barbers, and brewers. There were also many women like the character of the wife of Bath in Geoffrey Chaucer's poem, The Canterbury Tales, one of the most famous stories from the Middle Ages. 
the wife of Bath was an expert cloth maker and a woman of some wealth and property, which she inherited when her husband died. Women could only own property if they inherited it from their fathers or late husbands and lost that property if they married or remarried. Property laws were no different for high-born women from the upper classes. Although when their husbands were away on business at the royal court or fighting wars, many noble women had the power to manage the family castle and estate called a fief. These ladies of the manor would manage crops and herds and all of the serfs who lived in the fiefdom. Noble women also had more access to education and servants, which allowed them to become artists, musicians, and writers. One of the most noted women in medieval Europe was 14th century poet and author Christine de Pizan. Her writings, especially on the virtue and value of women, earned her wealth and fame. Yet lack of equality and opportunity made even this accomplished woman feel, as she wrote, most unfortunate because God had made me inhabit a female body in this world. One of the only alternatives for an upper class woman who did not want to be a wife and mother came from the same organization that restricted women in so many ways, the Roman Catholic Church. Women who became nuns could lead lives of work, prayer, and educational study. Nuns could rise to become the leaders of abbeys and monasteries, sometimes even overseeing male priests. Near the end of the Middle Ages, things began to change for women in some of the more developed city-states, such as Florence, where women were allowed into universities. But it would be centuries before women in Europe would win the first rights and freedoms that hundreds of millions of women have today. I wanted to show you that before we proceed on with the story because you have to know that to really appreciate how truly extraordinary Matilda is. When you see how she fights for her son, you're going to understand what she was up against. So we have women. Women are just pawns at this point in time. A man's daughter is only used as a leveraging tool, uh, um, something to uh, unite, Bargain. what? Bargain. A bargaining tool, yes. Some, it's a political tool. They are pawns, and that's what they are used for. But when I tell you that Matilda, even though she's the daughter of a king, even though she is the wife of an emperor, did that give her any authority? Not really. Maybe a little bit over her servants, but not really in um, the political world. Well, I want to tell you that the woman, the young woman holding the baby, that is a true expression of who Matilda is. But when you went up against that baby, this also is a true impression of who Matilda is. She enters into the anarchy. She is not going to allow this to happen. She's going to fight. She is going to go herself into battle up against Stephen. And so the country, England, is thrown into civil war. Matilda is not going to let him take the birthright away from her child. Now, the battles go on for years and years. In fact, this battle goes on for almost 20 years. The Civil War, I should say, not the battle. The Civil War goes on for almost 20 years. Stephen, of course, has the backing of the Pope. Is that important? Yes. Yeah. It's very important, all right? So Stephen is holding on to this. Matilda is keeping her son. He is in Anjou, in his father's land, uh, while these battles are going on and he's young. She's leaving and she herself is entering into battles along with Geoffrey. Geoffrey is also fighting 
for his son, but they realize at some point when Henry, little Henry, is nine years old to strengthen his claim that he needs to have lived in England. And so she sends Stephen to Bristol. I mean, um, she sends Henry to live in Bristol and he's educated there. He's receiving an education. Now his education is going to include academia as well as what? Military training, yes, he's going to definitely receive milita military training there. So he's in Bristol, and it's going to strengthen his claim because he's not going to be a foreigner. He'll have lived for years in England, but that poses a threat to young Henry, doesn't it? Because he's that much closer to Stephen's soldiers, right? Stephen could maybe get at him and probably would want to, I'm sure, correct? So as he's training, he's training in warfare, and as these years go by, his father, Jeffrey, is putting him in the lead of other battles to get him some experience and training. So he does. He is quite good at... Um, at battles, and so he is going up against Stephen himself now, all right? So his mother is gonna pull back, his, mo his father had passed away, and Matilda's gonna pull back, and who's taking charge now? The young, the young Henry. The young Henry is gonna go up against Stephen, and he goes up against him so hard, and now that he's a young man in his late teens, what's happening to the, to the nobles? In England they're feeling like oh maybe this is our guy because Stephen's getting older right so maybe this is our guy now Stephen has two sons he has two sons and they should inherit but because the constant barrage the constant battle civil war going on for 20 years Stephen finally decides maybe maybe I can get a break if I sign a treaty with young Henry, with young Henry. It is known as the Treaty of Winchester. It's signed in 1153, and it appears that it was something Stephen did just to put a Band-Aid on the situation because Stephen's son, it is rumored, had every intention of assassinating young Henry. So Stephen thought, if I sign this treaty with Henry, we'll take care of him later. And the treaty states that Stephen will remain in power until his death, at which point Henry Plantagenet would then become the heir, not Stephen's son. That's the treaty the Treaty of Winchester. It's also called the Treaty of Wallingford. Except something went a little bit wrong with that. Something went wrong, you know, because it, it always does, right? Something went wrong. So Stephen signs that in 1153, most likely not intending to live up to it. However, just a year, it was almost two years later, Stephen died. Stephen died. Henry's still alive. And we've got this signed treaty. So what happens? Henry, Henry Plantagenet. Henry II becomes what? Becomes king of England. And so this is who we know of as Henry II, first Plantagenet king. However, that was not how he was known at that time. That's not how he was called at that time. Do you know how he was called? Henry Fitz Empress. <laughs> Why? Why do you think? His yes, his mother, because he is heir to the throne through who? Matilda. 
through Matilda, exactly, through his mother, who was the empress. So this is Henry, son of the empress. Do you know how extraordinary that is? That is absolutely extraordinary. Now, we all agree, M Matilda was something else, yeah? Well, do you know that Henry uh, also has another incredibly strong woman that enters into his life? We're going to talk about her next week. The next woman that comes into his life. Does anybody know? Eleanor, Eleanor of, Aquitaine. of Aquitaine. Exactly. So next week, we're, oh, not next week, <laughs> two weeks. In two weeks, we're going to be talking about uh, the reign of Henry II, which is an unbelievable story. Every one of these is going to be an unbelievable story. And we're going to find out who uh, the second powerful, powerful woman is and how she affects his reign his 35-year reign as the King of England. So, so we're going to meet again in two weeks. And so I would like to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you for coming. See you in two weeks.